Today I'm going to teach you how to plot a moment tensor solution on a stereo net. Plotting a moment tensor solution tells seismologists what kind of fault caused the earthquake and how the fault is oriented. This helps to figure out the motion and geometry of the fault. There are three types of faults, normal faults, strike-slip faults, and thrust faults or reverse faults. These moment tensor solutions are also called beach ball diagrams because they look similar to a beach ball fault plane solutions, and focal mechanism solutions. So the materials you'll need are a data set from a particular earthquake, which includes the azimuth that the wave travels, the takeoff angle of the P wave, or the distance from the seismic station to the earthquake's epicenter. Either of those could be used, and the P wave's first motion whether the P wave moves up or down on the seismogram, which is a graph that gives a record of ground movement during and in between earthquakes. The data set can be acquired from an earthquake observatory. I got mine from the Alaska Earthquake Information Center. And if the first motions are not given, they can be found by looking at the individual waveforms on the seismograph and noting whether the wave travels up or down when it first arrives. Then you'll want to prepare your materials. You can print out a stereo net, also known as a stereographic projection, online. I use an equal area or Schmidt stereo net. An equal area stereo, stereo net is best for plotting these fault plane solutions. Prepare by placing the tracing paper on the top of the stereo net and inserting the push pin through the tracing paper starting at the back side of the stereo net so the pointy end of the pushpin sticks out. Then trace the outer circle of the stereo net on the tracing paper and mark north, south, east, and west at the correct spots. Now you'll plot the data. A note before plotting. The points are plotted using the conventional system, an open circle if the P wave first motion is down, and a closed circle if the P wave first motion is up. For each seismic station, which is each line of data in your data set, locate the azimuth on the outer edge of the stereo net, make a line on the tracing paper, and turn that azimuth so it is aligned with north on the stereo net. Use the takeoff angle to find the distance from the center of the plot to the point where you put your circle. If the takeoff angle is not given, use the table provided to convert the distance from the seismic station to the earthquake's epicenter to find the takeoff angle. The table is provided on the next slide. Count from the center towards north. Each line represents two degrees on the stereo net. Count over until you've reached the correct number for your takeoff angle, then place a point that corresponds to the P wave's first motion, then open or close circle. Then turn the tracing paper so north on the tracing paper is again aligned with north on the stereo net. Now let's take a look at those steps. So these steps are shown for a station from my data from the 2011 Japan earthquake and the azimuth for this point is 345 degrees and the distance from the earthquake to or from the earthquake's epicenter to this station is 25 degrees. So first I found 345 degrees, I marked a dash for it, and turned it to north. Then I looked at my conversion table, and my distance was 25 degrees, so my takeoff angle is 30 degrees. I counted up 30 degrees from the center, here's the center, and each of these lines is 10, 20, 30, and I plotted a closed circle. Then I turned north again so it is aligned with north on the stereo net. So you continue this until all of your points are plotted. And once all your points are plotted, a pattern of open and closed circles will be somewhat recognizable. Now look for places where these open and closed circles are close to one another. This will indicate where the nodal planes are located. The nodal planes are the possible solutions to the fault plane 
and the fault plane is what tells seismologists about the mechanism and geometry of the fault that caused the earthquake. Every earthquake has two nodal planes that are 90 degrees from each other. Using the great circles on the stereo net, those longitudinal curves that travel north-south, move the tracing paper around to find a great circle that divides areas of open and closed points. This is your first nodal plane. The important aspect of the nodal plane is that it divides these open and closed circles, no matter which side of the line they are on. Depending on the fault's geometry, the open and closed points may switch which side of the great circle they are on, but there will still be four distinct areas of open and closed circles. This is okay. Remember, there are two solutions, and you've only drawn the first one. And here's my solution. You can see on mine, the open and closed circles are easily distinguished, and I only have two areas of them. On some, you may find that down here, the open circles might be on this side, while the closed circles might be on this side. That's okay. Now you'll plot the pole to the first nodal plane. So turn the great circle so it touches north at the top and south at the bottom. Now count along the east-west line from your first nodal plane towards the center 90 degrees. You'll pass through the center point, but keep going. Once you've counted over 90 degrees, mark an X for the pole to the first nodal plane. You can see I counted over 90 degrees on this east-west line and plotted my point. Now you'll plot the second nodal plane. It should pass through the first or through the pole of the first nodal plane. Then find a great circle that passes through the pole of the first nodal plane, marked by an X, and divides the open and closed points, if possible. As you can see here in a minute, I don't have any closed points or open points that really tell me the difference over here, but it at least passes through the pole to the first nodal plane. Now you'll trace that great circle on the tracing paper and color in the areas with closed circles. So here I've traced that second plane and it goes through my X. And here I've colored in the closed points in pink. So now you'll determine the primary and auxiliary planes. To do this, you'll look at a map showing the fault where the earthquake originated. This may take some geologic knowledge. For mine, I know that Japan occurs in a subduction zone, and the subduction zone runs more similar to this first nodal plane that I plotted. The orientation of the fault on the map is the orientation of the primary plane. So for example, if the fault runs northeast-southwest on the map, it will run northeast southwest on your plot. And mine um, is actually an example of that. The area where Japan is, the subduction zone, runs northeast southwest. So, therefore, this is my primary plane, and the other one, consequently, is my auxiliary plane. Now you can look at this provided graphic to see what type of fault caused the earthquake. And once you've done that, you can look on line to check your solution. And this is my solution. It matches up, so I'm pretty happy with that.